Hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this Palm Sunday worship at Aldersgate United Methodist Church. I'm Bill Johnson, your liturgist, and I'm here today to tell you we're in phase one of returning to in-person worship, which means Pastor Jim and a few worship volunteers are in the sanctuary today. Our worship design team is planning two opportunities for worship for Easter next week. First, weather permitting, we'll worship outdoors Sunday morning at 9.30 in front of the church. Please bring your own chair and wear a mask and practice social distancing at all times. And if you're like Wendy Clark, bring a blanket. If you come without a mask or a chair, we'll have both of them available. The second opportunity is virtual worship with a pre-recorded service for those unable to attend the outdoor service or if we, have, if we experience bad weather. Either way, we'll be celebrating our risen Christ and hope you'll be there. Our Lenten series is called Again and Again, a Lenten Refrain. And today's message is called Again and Again, We Draw on Courage. It's Palm Sunday when we remember that Jesus' entry into Jerusalem was not a risk-free palm party. It was a protest parade, a protest against those in power, a parade to prepare the way for the, a different kind of king. And this was happening with plots to kill Lazarus and Jesus building in the background. So, the crowds were brave to show up that day. And Jesus drew on courage to face his final journey to the cross. Give some thought to these questions today. How do you define courage? How do you access it? And what events in your life have required the most courage? In today's scripture, note each character who draws on courage and each character who avoids it. What does each character risk? And what do they gain? Now it's time to take a deep breath as we begin. Let God's Spirit fill every part of you quieting your mind and listening for God's word. The candle is lit, reminding us of Christ, who is our light, again and again. Please join me now in the call to worship. The story of faith is a story of courage. It took courage for John the Baptist to prepare the way. It took courage for Mary to say, here I am, use me. It took courage for the disciples to drop their nets and follow Jesus. It took courage for the paralyzed man's friends to lower him through the roof. It took courage for Peter to walk on water. It took courage for Zacchaeus to give half of his possessions to the poor. It took courage for Jesus to enter Jerusalem on a donkey. Faith has never been easy. It's a journey of courage. Again and again, God shows us the way. Let us worship a brave and courageous God. Okay. 
Good morning. This is Miss Ann for Children's Time. Hosanna. If any of um, the kids or adults have a palm branch or something like a palm branch and you want to wave and say Hosanna with me, remember that. And, and Ash, like the cat, also likes the palm branch. <laughs> um, remember that when um, Jesus was um, going into Jerusalem, um, for there were people that needed a lot of courage. Um, to be there and some of them put palm branches on the ground for Jesus to come or they put their coats so maybe some kids to this morning you guys could practice doing that um having your own parade um and putting waving your palm branches or putting them on the ground or making a palm branch or putting your coats on the ground and practicing that would be fun we have a story today it is called Sheila Ray the Brave and this is by Kevin Henkes Sheila Ray wasn't afraid of anything. She wasn't afraid of the dark. She wasn't afraid of thunder and lightning. And she wasn't afraid of the big black dog at the end of the block. At dinner, Sheila Ray made believe that the cherries in her fruit cocktail were the eyes of dead bears and she ate five of them. And at school, she giggled when the principal walked by. And when her classmate Wendell stole her jump rope during recess, Sheila Ray tied him up until the bell rang. I am very brave, Sheila Ray said, patting herself on the back. Sheila Ray stepped on every crack in the sidewalk without fear. And when her sister Louise said there was a monster in the closet, Sheila Ray attacked it. And she rode her bicycle no handed with her eyes closed. Not a good idea. Yay, yay, Sheila Ray, her friends yelled, clapping their hands. One day, Sheila Ray decided to walk home from school a new way. Louise was afraid to. You're too brave for me, Louise said. You're always such a scaredy cat, Sheila Ray called. Am not, whispered Louise. Sheila Ray started off skipping. I am brave, I am fearless, she sang. She stepped on every crack and she walked backwards with her eyes closed. She growled at stray dogs and bared her teeth at stray cats. And she pretended that the trees were evil creatures. She snapped, or she climbed up them and broke their fingers off. Snap, snap, snap. Sheila Ray walked and walked. She turned corners. She crossed streets. It suddenly occurred to Sheila Ray that nothing looked familiar. Sheila Ray heard frightening noises. They sounded worse than thunder. She thought horrible thoughts. They were worse than anything she had ever imagined. I am brave, Sheila Ray tried to convince herself. I am fearless. The sounds became more frightening. The thoughts became more horrible. Sheila Ray sat down on a rock and cried. Help, she sniffed. She thought of her mother and her father and Louise. Mother, father, Louise, she cried. Here I am, a voice said. Louise, Sheila Ray hugged her sister. We're lost, Sheila Ray said. No, we're not, said Louise. I know the way home, follow me. Louise stepped on every crack. She walked backwards with her eyes closed. She growled at stray dogs and bared her teeth at stray cats. And she pretended that the trees were evil creatures and she jumped up and broke their fingers off. Snap, snap, snap. Sheila Gray walked quietly behind her. They walked and walked. They crossed streets. They turned corners. Soon their house could be seen between the trees. Sheila Ray grabbed Louise and dashed up the street. When they reached their own yard and the gate was closed behind them, Sheila Ray said, Louise, you are brave. You are fearless. We both are, said Louise. And they walked backward into the house with their eyes closed. This is a long, hard week for Jesus. Today, we remember the parade that we were talking about. Um, this, we are calling it a protest parade, and that, that's what he led. And on Thursday, we remember that Jesus had dinner with his friends, and then one of his friends betrayed him. On Friday, we're going to remember how Jesus was arrested and sentenced to die, even though he didn't do anything wrong. Jesus knew this is how the week would end, and so he had to be very brave. Sometimes God needs us to do hard things. But the good news is that God also gives us courage. 
And when we don't have enough courage ourselves, we can borrow it from others, just like Sheila Ray um, had to borrow some courage from Louise when she was scared. That's why when we protest like Jesus to stand up for what's right, we do it together. We help each other to be brave and we have to do some, when we have to do something hard. Let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for the courage to do hard things. Help us to be brave even when we are scared. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, everyone. Have a good week. Glennon Doyle, a famous author and writer, frequently uses the phrase, we can do hard things. It is one of her many mottos in life. As a result of this declaration, we can do hard things, has become an anthem for so many. You can buy these words on poster prints, on greeting cards, and even on coffee mugs. These five simple words aren't particularly radical. So when I stop to think about why they have caught hold for so many, I can only assume that it is because life and faith require courage. Vulnerability requires courage. Relationships require courage. Advocacy and justice require courage. Facing our privilege requires courage. Faith requires courage. Even confession requires courage. So friends, let's do hard things. Let us confess together, trusting that God is always there, cheering us on every courageous act. Let us pray. God of palm branches and hallelujahs, we confess we love a good Palm Sunday celebration. We love the sound of a joyful parade. We love shouting hallelujah. We love that Palm Sunday means Easter is just around the corner. We love good news. However, if we slow down and pay attention, we know that Palm Sunday was not a walk in the park for us. There was risk. There was fear. 
there was the threat of violence. You were leading a peaceful protest against an unjust empire, and the whole world knew it. Forgive us for glossing over the courage this day took. Remind us that the story of faith is a story of courage, and even we can do hard things. With hope, we pray. Amen. Family of faith, even when we gloss over the truth, even when our courage fails us, even when we doubt that we can do hard things, God believes in us, God loves us, God forgives us. Hear and believe this truth. We are known, we are loved, we are forgiven again and again and again. Amen. Our scripture is from John 12, 1 through 19, from the Contemporary English Bible, the Common English Bible. Oh my, my, how time flies. Whether you're having fun or not, it just does. It's Palm Sunday. The calendar says it's spring. The world is about to burst forth in new life. So what about our faith? Has it been decimated by the global pandemic? Or are we becoming more and more ready to burst forth in beauty and generous giving in the name of God's love? Our scripture from the Gospel of John, chapter 12, the first 19 verses, may help us with that. First, let's offer a prayer. If we could buy our way closer to you, we'd sell everything we have. If we could work our way to you, we'd never take a day off. If we could walk our way to you, we'd keep our tennis shoes on tight. But I know, we know, we cannot buy or work or walk our way closer to you. We must listen our way closer to you. So, holy God, as you have done so often again and again, open our ears. Clear out the self-talk that keeps us from you. Dust out the negativity and distractions. Remove any doubt hindering our way. Amen. This is the word of God from the Gospel of John. Six days before Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, home of Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Lazarus and his sisters hosted a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was among those who joined him at the table. Then Mary took an extraordinary amount, almost three quarters of a pound, of very expensive perfume. It was made of pure nard. She anointed Jesus' feet with it, then wiped his feet dry with her hair. The house was filled with the aroma of the perfume, and Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, complained, this perfume was worth a, day's, a year's wages. Why wasn't it sold and the money given to the poor? He said this, not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He carried the money bag, and he would take what was in it. Then Jesus said, leave her alone. This perfume was to be used in preparation for my burial, and this is how she has used it. You will always have the poor among you, but you won't always have me. Many Jews learned that he was there. They came out only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. The chief priests decided that they would kill Lazarus too. It, would be, it was because of Lazarus that many of the Jews had deserted them and come to believe in Jesus. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. They took 
palm branches and went out to meet him. They shouted, Hosanna! Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written. Don't be afraid, daughter Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's coat. His disciples didn't understand these things at first. After he was glorified, they remembered that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. The crowd who had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead were testifying about him. And that's why the crowd came to meet him, because they had heard about this miraculous sign that he had done. Therefore, the Pharisees said to each other, See, you've accomplished nothing. Look, the whole world is following him. Amen. Thank you, Bill. I'm Jim Hodge, pastor of the Aldersgate United Methodist Church, and before we begin, I'd like to take an opportunity to thank all of our techies, folks in the room, and folks who are rotating in and out of this room as we continue with phase that we're in. They help make our worship, virtual worship possible, so we thank them, and we thank you also, friends and neighbors and members who continue to tune in and share your support. All of that helps us to be in ministry with one another and within our community. So far in our Lenten series, again and again, we've talked about how God calls us beloved, how we're called to really listen to God, how God's Spirit leads us, and how God loved us first. Today we're considering the ways God um, uh, gives us courage. First, let's pray. Bless these parade palms, O God of celebration. May they remind us of the simple joys of living. May we remember the excitement that comes with following Christ. Bless these protest palms, O God of justice. May they remind us that empire is not a thing of the past. May they make us bold and brave to stand up against injustice. Bless these funeral palms, O God of comfort. May they remind us of the road that lies ahead. May they encourage us in times of grief and pain. We give you thanks for the parade, the protest, the processional. Guide our steps through the holiest of weeks, this week's, as we cry out together, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Amen. So political protest, that's what it was, plain and simple protest against the brutality and corruption of the Roman occupation, yes, and, and protest against the myriad corrupt ways from tax collecting to enforcing Moses' Big Ten among the masses, the religious authorities decreed in playing along with it all. It took courage to face power like that, to call out the injustice and suffering it bred, so what is courage? Dr. Google says that courage is the ability to do something that frightens one. Well, okay, Revner, that definition is kind of bland, kind of boring. Maybe we should ask a few notables to expand on that. That's a great idea. Here's a few. Poet, essayist, publisher, playwright, literary critic, and editor, T.S. Eliot, considered one of the 20th century's major poets, wrote, only those who will risk going too far can possibly find out how far one can go. 
Another brilliant poet, memorist, and civil rights activist, Maya Angelou wrote, courage is the most important of all the virtues because without courage, you cannot practice any other virtue consistently. You can practice any virtue erratically, but nothing consistently without courage. Existentialist psychologist Rollo May once wrote, the opposite of courage is not cowardice, it is conformity. Even a dead fish can go with the flow. <laughs> Novelist, satirist, and poet Erica Jong wrote, everyone has a talent. What is rare is the courage to follow the talent to the dark places where it leads. The dark places. Dark places where it leads. Courage leads us to dark places. That notion has been careening through my skull this past week dark places. Now, I've tried to extradite my noggin from such flogging, but thus far my efforts have proved fruitless. So, full disclosure, friends, I'm not exactly sure where this meager attempt at good news is going. Now, I could try to lighten things up, you know, look on the bright side of life, the way most Western Hemisphere Christians prefer their weekly worship hour, happy, clappy, and snappy. Back, way back before the middle of the previous century, composer Harold Arlen and lyricist E.Y. Harburg wrote a little ditty about courage for a movie. The song was crooned by a cowardly lion on his way to the Emerald City with Dorothy Toto, the Tin Woodsman, and the Scarecrow in the 1939 movie, The Wizard of Oz. If I were king of the forest, not queen, not duke, not prince, my regal robes of the forest would be satin, not cotton, not chintz. I'd command each thing, be it fish or fowl, with a rough and a rough and a royal growl, woof. As I'd click my heel, all the trees would kneel, and the mountains bow, and the bulls kowtow, and the sparrow would take wing, if I were king. Each rabbit would show respect to me, the chipmunks genuflect to me. Though my tail would lash, I would show compassion. For every underling, if I were king, I'd be monarch of all I survey. How? Courage. What makes a king out of a slave? Courage. What makes the flag on a mast to wave? Courage. What makes the elephant charge his tusk in the misty mist or the dusky dust? What makes the muskrat guard his musk? Courage. What makes the sphinx the seventh wonder? Courage. What makes the dawn come up like thunder? Courage. What makes the hottentot so hot? Who puts the ape an apricot. What have I got, or what have they got that I ain't got? Courage. Nice try, but no. The dark place is still noodling around up there. So here's the wonderment. Where would you stand if you were one of the 12 and you knew Jesus' plans for the high feast day of the Passover celebration in Jerusalem, the permissioned borrowing of that new cult, the parade, the crowds, the palm branches? With your awareness of the context, the often violent responses to such events by the Roman military, which had happened 
frequently in years previous to this. The disdain shown Jesus by the religious authorities centered at the temple in Jerusalem. What counsel would you offer him? Yeah, JC, let's go, let's do this. Or would it be something else? Something a bit more cautious. Most of us have a little voice that whispers in our ear. <laughs> That's dangerous. Watch out. Maybe, maybe we should wait, you know, give it, give it some time. And one of my favorites, <laughs> I wouldn't do that if I were you. We, most of us, would be that voice to Jesus. I'm not sure about that, Jesus. I'm, I'm just not that brave. I can't muster that kind of courage. And Jesus might well respond, don't tell me you don't have courage. So is that where this ends up for us, for you? and me? How are we to understand what makes for and how we come by courage? How exactly does one become courageous? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Here are several observations I've made about being courageous in dark places. Becoming courageous has everything to do with embracing vulnerability. People who live fear-based lives often have very little confidence in themselves. Opening yourself up to others, letting them see who and whose you are, who God made you to be, to become, by and large, despite the risks, it dissipates internal fear. Another way to embody courage is to admit you have fears. Identifying what you're truly afraid of is the beginning of overcoming those fears. And once you've identified your fears, face them. You know, sometimes you may even defeat a fear or a phobia in this way. I have a friend who was once terrified of dogs until she took a class and began to work with professionals and dog trainers. And after a time, her fear of dogs was gone. And even if you can't dispatch your fear completely, living life alongside of it, instead of hiding underneath it, it's definitely much healthier. Being courageous also requires positive thinking. Now, I'm not talking about the perversion of Dr. Norman Vincent Peale's work by the swindling preachers of the prosperity gospel here. What I mean by positive thinking is allowing others to love you and to show you affection and appreciation. No matter what you might think of yourself, God has made you lovable in some ways. Taking good care of yourself is also a manifestation of one who has courage. It is difficult, and a person can be judged harshly at times for taking steps to reduce their stress, or to eat well, or to exercise in a regular fashion, or to get enough sleep, or to take meaningful and restful Sabbath time. Another way to become courageous is, well, by practicing courage. Taking a risk, helping a person you don't know who is in need, 
intervening in a loving way, standing up for someone who's being bullied or shamed or judged unfairly. And even if you fail, and we all do, don't find the nearest corner and curl up in a fetal position. Let it go. Keep moving forward. Coping with failure and uncertainty is very much a part of being courageous. When we practice what we were meant to become, what God has created us to be and become, a musician, a writer, a parent, a spouse, a friend, we become better and better at it. We learn new things. We learn new things about ourselves, about others, about our talents, our God-given calling. And discovering your God-given calling is why having courage is so vital to faith. Because to live and to breathe that calling, whatever it is, it's going to take courage. Courage to fail. Courage to improve and learn new things. Courage to struggle through difficulties. Courage to stay true to who you are. Anyway, that's where I go when I think about courage, when I think about being courageous. And still I wonder about Jesus. Don't you? Apparently so did the author of our worship series again and again, the Reverend Sarah Ars. She created a poem she calls Peaceful Protest. I wonder if Jesus could feel his heartbeat in his throat the way I do when I'm afraid. I wonder if he had to take deep breaths in through his nose, out through his mouth, tricking his body into a state of calm. I wonder if he was nauseous like I am when I'm headed into a hard conversation. I wonder if he had to summon his courage, tucking fear away that he could hold on to, so that he could hold on to what mattered most with both hands. I wonder because time has taught us that it is not uncommon for a peaceful protest to start or end with an unjust death. So I wonder, did he know? Was he afraid? Did anyone see it? I want to hold what matters with most with both hands. And there it is again, dark places. I don't know, maybe it's the liturgical week that we're heading into, or maybe I'm losing my marbles. I imagine Jesus was afraid. He was terrified out of his gourd, and he was courageous. And, and for God knows what reason, he was also hell-bent on self-destruction. I have grown weary of playing the game, orthodoxy's game, the church's game, of smoothing it all over by pretending the only way to embrace a life of faith is with a convenient alibi of predestined blood sacrifice. What Jesus did that high holy Passover day was sheer madness. In the context, it was sheer madness, and it was blatantly suicidal. And he knew it. And if he didn't know it, well, he was five loaves and two fish short of a miracle. How do I know this? 
because I know myself. For years now, I have shared my struggles with you. Anxiety, depression, deep, dark depression, the dread and discomfort of living in my own skin. And you may or may not be able to relate with the depth of that, but you kind of so, sort of know what it's like in that you inhabit your own skin. I'd like you to know how much I love you and appreciate your tolerating my musings and wonderings about such things, my shortcomings, my failures. For in and around all of that, through the Spirit, through you, I have found the courage and the strength to keep on. I've learned again and again and again to let failures go. Okay, well, most of the failures after considerable struggling. And still, still friends, the dysthymia remains. Lurking, brooding, waiting in those dark places, longing to undo me, which it nearly has twice before. You help me live alongside such peril instead of underneath it. So yes, I believe Jesus was shaking like a Palm Sunday palm leaf at the thought of what was to come. It takes courage to stand up to what's just and what is righteous. Yes! And, and, I know there is a lot more about Jesus we either don't understand or down through the ages had conveniently consigned to oblivion because it takes more courage to keep on living justly and righteously after you make that stand. There are people out there we are called to minister to and with. Let's keep on living. What do you say? Come now to a time of prayer, and as we do, there are several prayer requests. From Bill and Judy Johnson, prayers of joy for our recent visit with our youngest grandson, Carson. It was a reunion blessed by many prayers. Phyllis Robinson says, prayers for our leaders to have courage and for healing of the current onslaughts to our democracy. Wendy Clark asked for prayers for a little boy named Levi, who is recovering from a near drowning. He has a long journey ahead of him. We rejoice with Sandy Isley and her family in the success of her surgery and offer our prayers for her continued healing. Our friend Sheila Bennett expresses thanks for all the prayers in the past weeks for her since her surgery and is also very grateful for all of Dale's help. Cookie Kramer thanks you for prayers for Jerry's brother and for Jerry. Both have graduated to walking boots and are doing well. Lori Elliott asks for prayers for her sister and her husband who is undergoing chemo treatment and having a hard time with side effects and a diagnosis of pneumonia. Kathy Hodge asks for continued prayers for her mom, Marilyn, who is struggling with being alone after 65 years of marriage. We also pray for Mary Lou Arnold, Joanne Ensley, Eleanor Howison, Lois Jessup, 
and Arlene Parker. I invite you to recite the Lord's Prayer at the end of our prayer time. I'll be using the word sins. Let's pray. O Redeemer Christ, you rode on. You rode over the cloaks and under the branches. You rode through the shouts and past the praises, receiving the praise that you deserved, but not confusing our praise in your presence for your purpose in coming. O Redeemer Christ, you rode on. You rode on toward the controversy of the cost and the cost. You rode toward the curses and the cross, receiving the stripes you didn't deserve. O Redeemer Christ, you rode on. You rode through the tomb and the grave. You rode through our time and space, ascending to a place that will never decay, a priesthood that will never pass away, a life of love that will always remain, and hearing us now even as we pray. O Redeemer Christ, you rode on. We remember the journey you have taken as we commit ourselves to walking the same way. So give us strength, hope, and joy we need as we follow. We offer this in all the prayers that we have named and left unnamed and lifted to you in the name of the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Family of faith, let us now celebrate what we believe. I refuse to believe that I am powerless. I refuse to believe that injustice and hatred are simply the way it has to be. I refuse to believe that I am better or more deserving than my neighbor. I refuse to believe that my self-worth is rooted in my accomplishments or appearance. I refuse to believe that the church is dying because I see God all around me. I refuse to believe that the traditions of old are the only path for moving forward. I refuse to believe that I cannot make a difference. So with hope in my heart, I will strive to live a life of courage, conviction, and compassion, just as Jesus taught us. Amen. As we conclude worship, may your mouth speak of God's goodness. May your arms hold those in need. May your feet walk toward justice. May your heart trust its worth. May your soul dance in God's grace. And may this be your rhythm again and again and again until God's promised day. 
in the name of the lover, the beloved, and love itself. Go with courage. Go with heart. Go in peace. Amen. Thank you.